Ephesians chapter 6, we have this familiar passage about the whole armor of God beginning in verse number 10. And just to put this in the greater context of the book of Ephesians, if you remember, we talked about recently how the book of Ephesians, you can really divide it in half. The first three chapters are really just talking about all the blessings that we enjoy being saved Christians. A lot of assurances are given to the Gentiles that they are now accepted in the beloved. They are now the chosen people of God. They're no longer strangers and foreigners, but they are fellow citizens of the commonwealth of Israel, of the household of faith. And so we have the first three chapters sort of just giving all those spiritual blessings about how our salvation is by grace, through faith, and, and all the things that Christ has done for us. Our salvation is just a done deal. But then in chapters 4 through 6, there is a lot more practical instruction and practical application. Chapter 4 talks a lot about having unity in the local church and just a lot of just things that we shouldn't be doing or should be doing about, uh, you know, not being drunk as we get into chapter 5, about not stealing in chapter 4, not uh, letting filthy communication come out of our mouth and, you know, just so many practical applications. In chapter 5, we have the passage about husbands and wives and how they're to interact within marriage. Chapter 6 is, uh, as we just read, telling children to obey their parents, servants to obey their masters. So after all of this really just practical advice about how to act within the church, how to act within the family, how to act in business and in life in general, he closes things out in verse 10 by saying, finally... My brethren, so this is sort of just a conclusion to the whole thing. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, (coughs) against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so what you have to understand is that as we read the advice given in chapters 4, 5, and 6, it seems really straightforward. And maybe you could even be tempted to look at it and say, well, this is going to be easy, simple, piece of cake, right? I mean, husbands, love your wives and everything's going to be great. Wives, submit to your husbands and everything's going to be great. Children, obey your parents. Everything will be great. Hey, as long as you're not lying and stealing and doing these things, you know, life's going to be great. But here's the thing about that is that it isn't that easy. It isn't that simple because as soon as you start actually following the admonitions of Scripture and putting chapter 4 into practice and putting chapter 5 into practice and putting chapter 6 into practice, guess what? There's an enemy out there trying to stop you from living right, trying to stop you from serving God and to stop you from having the blessings that God wants for you. And so it's not just as simple as, oh, do the right things and everything's going to be great. No, because when you do the right thing, there is still an organized, concerted attack against you that you're going to have to be able to withstand. You know, I remember talking to a young man and, uh, well, we were having a conversation about marriage and, and it was, it was uh, several guys that were married that were having this conversation. And then this young single guy just said, well, you know, I don't understand what's the big deal. What's so hard about it? It's just husbands love your wives. I mean, you know, and this guy then got married less than a year later, and his marriage lasted about three months, literally. You know, but he was just so confident. Just, husbands love your wives. What's the big deal? What's so hard? What's the big deal? Well, you'll find out, buddy, when you actually get married. You know, you'll find out what the big deal is when you actually try having children, running a business, doing whatever you do in life. Life ends up not being as straightforward and simple as just, oh, do the right things and everything's going to be great. No, you do the right things and everything's going great, everything's going smooth, but then the devil comes along and throws a monkey wrench in what you're trying to do, right? You're pastoring a church or you're a member in a church and you're trying to evangelize the community and what happens, you know? The devil comes in and tries to throw a monkey wrench into things. And so that's why it's not enough to just know, don't sin, be a good husband, be a good wife, be a good parent, be a good child. 
that ends up not being enough. We need to be ready to stand in the evil day as well. Because every day is not just going to be a normal get up, do all the right things, be blessed and go to bed at night. If only it were that simple. It'd be wonderful, but it isn't. That's why we've got to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Because if we are spiritually weak, then when the evil day comes, we will fold like a, a deck of cards. Right? And we will not be able to stand up for what's right. So we've got to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And it says, put on the whole armor of God. Now, when the Bible talks about the armor of God, right? What kind of an of are we talking about here? We're talking an of like source of, right? This armor comes from God. This is the armor that is provided by God. And this goes in line with the idea of being strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. It's not just our own innate character or strength or fortitude or goodness or whatever. It's going to have to be from God that we have the power to get through the wiles of the devil and, and the attacks that Satan will bring. And so it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, right? The devil and his wiles. Wiles would be like deceits, tricks, traps, different things that he has concocted for us, his machinations. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. You know, it'd be simpler if it was just a human physical enemy we could identify and just, hey, stay away from that guy or whatever. It's not as simple as just a physical enemy that's just easily identifiable. You know, we're wearing one uniform and he's wearing a different color uniform. And so we know he's the bad guy. No, the devil is transformed into an angel of light. The devil will come in and deceive you seeming to be good, trying to seem to be righteous. And so we have to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against something more difficult, against something more insidious, principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, those three phrases together, principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. You know, when you put this together, what you get is an organized attack against God's people, not just random, you know, the devil just kind of throwing something at you out of nowhere, but rather that there is a systemic, organized, orchestrated attack in this world, not just against one individual Christian, but rather just against Christians in general. There's a system in place that is there to try to trip you up. And so this is a very formidable foe. This is a really sophisticated opponent that we're dealing with here that is coming at us. It's not just a flesh and blood opponent. It's principalities. It's powers against rulers of the darkness of this world. Now, what does that even mean, principalities and powers? Well, powers in this context are talking about authorities, right? The powers that be, right? Principalities are, again, talking about rulers, talking about, uh, you know, organizations and powerful people, the rulers of the darkness of this world and so forth, right? So when we think about principalities and powers, we could think about governments, we can think about corporations, right? We could think about religious denominations, you know, powerful organizations is what we're talking about with rulers and leaders and people in charge that are steering the darkness of this world. And of course, ultimately, this is demonic, right? Satan is at the top of this evil pyramid and you've got his minions spiritually, his demonic minions, and then also the human beings that are working for him. You know, there are entire corporations and businesses and, and governments that are out to subvert right living. I mean, what did, what did the Apostle Paul just finish telling us? How a marriage is supposed to be, you know, with the wife submitting to her husband, with the husband loving his wife, with children obeying their parents. But are there not 
entire corporations and media outlets whose goal is just to subvert those values and destroy that system of the family. And so here we are, we're trying to have a biblical family, and we've got this evil orchestrated attack on the family trying to get in there and twist our minds and teach us all these weird alternative lifestyles and try to make the Bible look stupid or try to make God's way look wrong or stupid or abusive or whatever, right? Because the devil hates God's people. And he doesn't want us to just be able to just go through our lives living a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty and just evangelizing the lost. He's not just going to let that happen without a fight. He's there as an adversary. And so that's what the Bible is talking about when it says principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world. It's not just necessarily governments. It could also be corporations it's also religious denominations because keep in mind those are very powerful entities in the world in which we live right it's not just the united states government that has power it's banks that have power it's religious denominations that have power the roman catholic church has power right these other various denominations and religions of east orthodox and whatever they have power And they're wicked, they're ungodly, and they're out to destroy that which is righteous. And so because of this, verse 13, wherefore, he says, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now, when the Bible says here the evil day, I don't believe that this is primarily talking about a specific end times evil day in the future or something like that, 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 you know, one generation is going to grapple with. I think that when he says uh, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, this evil day can come at various points in anyone's life, right? Just your evil day, right? The evil day is just that day in which you are under serious attack. And when you are struggling to, you know, keep your head above water spiritually, That's what the Bible is talking about when it says that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore. Now, obviously it jumps out at you just how many times the word stand is repeated. We were told to stand in verse 11. In verse 13, it's withstand, stand, and then verse 14, stand. So just four times in a row, just stand, 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 stand. And you see, the idea here is not necessarily that we are to... Uh, be as Christians going and taking over these institutions and we're going to defeat the U.S. government and we're going to defeat, you know, uh, the uh, YouTube and we're going to defeat Amazon and we're going to defeat, you know, the Roman Catholic Church. We're going to defeat the Mormon Church because you want to talk about a demonic principality and power. It's the Latter-day Satan Church based in Salt Lake City, Utah. But, you know, what the Bible is not telling us is, hey, you know, you're going to go in there and you're going to overthrow these institutions. Folks, these institutions have existed before we were born and they will always exist, right? The devil is going to have all of his wicked institutions and powers, and we're not going to be able to overthrow these things. It's not our job to overthrow these things. And in reality, if you stop and think about it, Christ has already gotten the victory over all of these institutions. He's already won the battle. The battle's already been fought and won. Keep your finger here and go to the parallel passage in Colossians. Colossians is a is a is a book that's parallel with Ephesians. Most things in Ephesians, you'll find the same stuff taught in Colossians, worded just a little bit differently. But over in Colossians chapter number three, or I'm sorry, chapter number two, it says in verse 14 of Colossians 2, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. And took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers. Notice the same wording here. Having spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And so, you know, Christ conquered at the cross, right? Christ's death, burial, and resurrection was a conquering of all of these spiritual enemies, conquering of Satan, conquering of his kingdom. And so in reality, 
you know, the devil and his minions are already defeated. They're already beaten. Okay. It's sort of like you read about history where there'll be a decisive battle where at that point it's obvious who the winner of the war is. The other side just can't win anymore. Uh, and so that's kind of like when most of us will kind of think of as when that war ended. But then the war doesn't officially end sometimes for a few more months or even a few more years or something. You know, like I, I'm a little rusty on my American history. It's been a long time. But, you know, I want to say there was a major battle in 1781 at Yorktown that just kind of finished the American Revolution. And then in 1783, though, is when it was like officially the war's not over officially till 1783. Can I get a witness, sir? All right, good. One person says that I'm, I'm accurate. It's been years, but that, that seems vaguely familiar to me. You know, you think about other uh, major battles in history, obviously, where there'll be a decisive battle. You know, the, the other side's beaten, but maybe it takes a few months for there to be a surrender, for there to be a treaty, for it to be officially over, whatever. You know, the decisive victory is Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. It's over for the devil at that point. You know what I mean? He's defeated. He knoweth that he hath a little time. Uh, you know, obviously that's going to be more literally true in the end times. But the point is that the devil and his minions are defeated. It's not our job to feel like we have to go out there and just eradicate evil from this world. It's a fool's errand. It's never going to happen. You know, let's say we were to just completely put the Mormon church out of business. We'd love to do that. Some other weird cult would just spring up somewhere else. You know, because this is just the way the world works. This is the way the world's supposed to work. And so God has allowed that the wheat and the tares would both grow together at the same time until the end of the world. That's what the Bible says. And so the devil and his means have already been defeated. But what we need to do is just stand our ground is what we need to do. You know, Christ has already purchased the church in his own blood. He's already given us all the things that we need to live the godly, Christian, effective life. And we've already got everything we need, but we've got to stand our ground and not give ground to Satan. We need to stand. We need to withstand. So in many ways, it's a defensive battle, which is why it's the whole armor of God. And it's focusing on defensive armor. Obviously, there's a sword involved, but in general, it's mainly, offend it's mainly a defensive armor because of the fact that the battle's really already been won. And we just need to stand our ground as Christians and not give ground to Satan. And you know what? Specifically, let's not give ground. Let's get this in context. Why don't we not give ground when it comes to one Lord, one faith, one baptism of Ephesians chapter 4? Why don't we not give ground when it comes to the roles of men and women in marriage in Ephesians chapter 5? Why don't we not give ground when it comes to children honoring their father and mother? You know, those are the things the devil wants to attack. And those are the things on which we should not give any ground. We should stand and withstand in the evil day. Stand therefore. And then he talks about what the whole armor of God consists of that's going to allow us to stand in the evil day. It says, stand therefore, verse 14, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. Now, when you think about the devil's attack on us, we're not ignorant of his devices. He starts out at the very beginning of the Bible questioning God's word, right? Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And so as we're going about our Christian lives and trying to put into practice what we've learned in chapter four, chapter five and chapter six about just how to live the Christian life, the devil's going to come at us and try to get us to doubt what we're doing and try to get us to doubt the wisdom of the way of life that God has given us, right? He'll try to show us some other way to live our lives that's supposedly better or, or try to get us to doubt that God's way is going to work, 
or that the Bible really means what it says. He'll try to twist it into meaning something totally different. And so if you think about most of these pieces of armor, what they end up doing is giving us assurance that we are in the right place. We are doing what God wants us to do. We do believe what's right. And so it, it gives us the assurance when the devil's coming at us trying to get us to doubt trying to get us to, uh, you know, reject the teachings of God's word or, or to live our life according to the way of this world, you know, we've got to be firm on these things and strong on these things. And the, the first piece of armor here is having your loins girt about with truth, you know, understanding that God's word is the ultimate truth. We have the truth and we should be people who care about truth and hate lies. And so if we care about truth and we hate lies and we know that Jesus Christ said, thy word is truth. You know, this should help us to stand in the evil day when it seems like maybe uh, things are falling apart for us. When it seems like uh, our life isn't working out the way that it was supposed to, even though we we followed God's word and things aren't going well, you know, and then we wonder, hey, am I all wrong here? You know, maybe maybe these worldly people are right. Maybe these corporations are right. Maybe the media is right. Maybe Hollywood's right. Maybe these other denominations are right. And, you know, you start to doubt. But you've got to stop and say, what is the truth according to God's word? Right. That is going to be the thing that keeps you cinched down and tightened up on the truth. It, it's got to be, you know, first of all. I love truth. I care about truth. And the word of God is truth. You know, that's going to keep us standing when maybe our life sometimes isn't going the way that we expect it to go. I mean, look at a guy like Job. You know, Job's doing all the right things. The devil attacks Job. And, you know, he could be tempted to say, maybe I'm not living my life the right way. Maybe following the Lord is not the right path. Maybe I should be listening to these other worldly people or these other pagans or something. But of course, he didn't do that. He kept his integrity. He stayed with the Lord. We've got to have our loins girt about with truth. Truth matters. We should be lovers of truth. And, and, and that means that when someone shows us facts, we should accept those facts and not just deny reality. And even amongst independent fundamental Baptists, you'll get this kind of reality denial sometimes when they just see something that goes in the face of what they believe. They just kind of stick their head in the sand. And whenever I see that mentality, I just say to myself, this is not a lover of truth. And, you know, I wonder if this person's going to be able to stand in the evil day when they're one who ignores truth. You know, look, when I go soul winning and I show someone something point blank from the word of God, you know, I expect them to believe it. If they used to believe that it was by works and I'm showing them that it's by faith, I expect them to change what they believe because of what the Bible says. You know, but then a lot of Christians are hypocrites because then they'll be shown clear scripture point blank from the word of God that's obvious. And then they just don't want to accept it. They just don't want to accept facts. They don't want to accept truth. You know, we need to be lovers of truth. We need to be willing to embrace the facts wherever they lead. Even if we don't like where the facts lead or where the truth leads, you know, we should be lovers of truth. One of these reality deniers a few years ago said, uh, you know, we don't walk by facts. We walk by faith. It was like the stupidest quote of the year. Maybe even the stupidest quote of the century. We don't walk by facts. We walk by faith. Blah, 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 blah. You know, faith should be based in, oh, here's another word for facts, truth. Yeah. Truth. F faith should be based in truth. If you're just, oh, you're just such a great person of faith because you have so much faith in lies. I really admire you. <laughs> I really admire the fact that you have so much faith in fairy tales and fables and made up things that aren't true. No, my friend, the only thing worthy about faith is when your faith is in truth. So you got to have your loins girt about with truth. How are you going to stand in the evil day when your basis isn't truth? Truth needs to be your basis. And you know what? Young people growing up in these churches that are just kind of like a church that just kind of says, shut up and believe it because I said so. But they don't really give like 
truth or facts or basis, you know, eventually when the evil day comes for those young people, they're not going to be able to stand because they don't have their loins girt about with truth. Because they're going to realize that some of the stuff they're taught wasn't even true. We need to make sure that the stuff we're teaching is based in truth so we can withstand in the evil day. Because then no matter what happens, no matter what the onslaught, we can say, you know what? Hey, I know what the Bible says. I know what the truth is. And I am one who loves and believes and stands on truth. And so whatever the devil throws at me, I'm standing on truth. I got my loins girt about with truth. You know, the, uh, sometimes you could maybe try to think about like which article of clothing you know, goes with which attribute and, you know, it's, it's maybe questionable whether these things are connected, but, but Hey, you know, if you're not girt about with truth, you're going to get caught with your pants down spiritually, right? Because the, the, the belt or the girdle is what basically holds your pants up, Amen. keep you from being ashamed because you're not standing on truth. And so we got to have our loins girt about with truth and we got to have on the, the breastplate of righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness. Now, there are some other scriptures that talk about this breastplate of righteousness or, or that kind of deal with this same idea. Go if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. Of course, the Apostle Paul is ultimately quoting from Isaiah chapter 59. In Isaiah chapter 59, verse 17. Uh, talking about Jesus Christ, it says that he put on righteousness as a breastplate right? and um, a helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. So you, you have this reference to the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness back in Isaiah. And this is something that the Apostle Paul uses repeatedly. Obviously, Ephesians 6 is the big famous armor of God passage. But he talks about the armor of God in his other epistles, actually, as well. And one of these uh, places where this is touched upon is in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 3. It says, giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings. And so he's talking about, as a minister of God, he's going through all these trials and tribulations and difficult things. But then he talks about, beginning in verse number six, you know, how is he getting through these things? How is he living his life? How is he enduring these afflictions? He's doing it by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfaint. This is how he gets through these difficulties of the Christian life, right? Using pureness, using knowledge, and so on. And then it says in verse 7, by the word of truth, by the power of God. And then it says, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. So we have this idea of the armor of righteousness, which ties in with the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true. He say, look, we're telling the truth, but we're being treated as deceivers. You know, or people think of us as deceivers. Uh, we're, we're as unknown and yet well-known, right? Uh, as dying and behold, we live. As chastened and not killed. As sorrowful yet always rejoicing. As poor yet making many rich. As having nothing and yet possessing all things. And so the reason that I point out this passage is because there's kind of a question when the Bible talks about the armor of the breastplate of righteousness. Some people question, you know, is this the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ that we have as believers because we believe in Christ, Christ's righteousness imputed unto us? Or is this talking about righteousness as in doing the right things? You know, and I would lean toward the latter. That it's talking about righteousness as in doing right. You know, the Bible is talking about here how the Apostle Paul is getting through these hardships of the Christian life by pureness, knowledge, long suffering, kindness. These are things that he needs to exercise as a Christian in order to make it through 
these hard times by the word of truth. He's got to be in the Bible by the power of God. He's got to be filled with the Holy Spirit and have the power of Christ upon him by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. You know, we've got to do the right things if we want to succeed in the Christian life. Right. Sounds simple, but it's true. Look at first Thessalonians chapter five. Here's another allusion to the breastplate. Uh, this time the breastplate of faith and love, but another reference to the armor of God. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse six says, therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober for they that sleep, sleep in the night and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. So here, instead of the breastplate of righteousness, we have the breastplate of faith and love. Okay. And so obviously, yes, faith is what it takes to be saved, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to believe Jesus, the son of God, that he died for our sins, etc. But we also go through life with faith in God's word about other areas of life, right? If we're going to, you know, live the right way, we need to trust everything that God tells us in the Bible about how to live our lives. Like we said, about how to live in the church, about how to have a marriage, about how to raise our children and how to deal with our parents and so forth. And so we've got to trust those things and we've got to have love. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is doing right ultimately because love leads us to do the right things. Go if you would to Romans chapter 13. It's the last place we'll look at uh, to kind of like check out other parts of Paul's writings to figure out what he's talking about here with the armor of God. First Thessalonians, or sorry, Romans chapter 13, verse 12 says this, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. So again, you see here that putting on the whole armor of God has to do with living right. And that's why I think that the breastplate of righteousness has to do with living a righteous life as far as actually like living a life of Christian virtue is what the Bible's saying. It says, let us walk honestly. So he says, put on the armor of light. And he's going to expound on that. Let us walk honestly as in the day not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. So let's go back to Ephesians chapter six with that in mind. The Bible says in verse 14, have your loins girt about with truth. You got to make sure you're standing on truth. You got to make sure that you're a lover and believer of truth, that you're not one who just loves to deny reality and just embrace convenient untruths, but also have on the breastplate of righteousness. You know, if you're going to withstand in the evil day, you've got to know what the truth is and be willing to die for the truth. But not only that, you've also got to be one who puts the truth into practice in your life. You know, it's not enough to withstand in the evil day to know what the Bible says in Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, to understand what a marriage is supposed to be like, to understand what children are supposed to be like. No, no, you've got to do those things, right? To withstand in the evil day, you've got to be believing those things, relying on those things, and doing them. You've got to be a doer of the word if you want to withstand in the evil day. And so you got to have the breastplate of righteousness. And then he says in verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, right? So the devil's coming at you and he's trying to get you to doubt your way of life, trying to get you to doubt the Christian way of life, trying to get you to doubt your, your, your beliefs as a fundamental Baptist and, and trying to get you to think, hey, maybe I should be in one of these liberal denominations or maybe I should be more like the people on TV or something or more like the Hollywood and, and music industry types. Hey, maybe I should, you know, uh, rethink these things that, you know, are clearly laid out in the word of God. So the devil's coming at you with this. How does having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, how does this protect you from that type of an onslaught because if you think about it i mean 
having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, this is talking about being ready and able to evangelize, right? Because, you know, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, that bring glad tidings of good things. And so your feet shod with the, the preparation, the preparation is that you are ready. You're prepared to preach the gospel. And, and by the way, this is one of the reasons why soul winning is so important. Obviously, soul winning is important for its own sake. Getting someone saved, I mean, that in and of itself is... is an amazing thing and worth it and something that we need to be doing just because we love lost people and we just want to get people saved. Obviously, soul winning is an end in and of itself. Okay, but another thing that I'm constantly bringing up to people about why it's so important to get out there and go soul winning door to door, and this is a big one for me, is that if you go out door to door soul winning, you will actually get good at explaining the gospel okay and then when you're in a situation where you have that loved one that you really care about that friend that you really care about that co-worker that you really care about and you have the opportunity to give them the gospel you're not gonna be oh uh, 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 uh. you don't know where to turn you don't have the bible verse and you know what you're not always gonna have a bible with you you know, at the risk of sounding like that teacher in the 90s who told you you're not always going to have a calculator with you, and then it turns out you are always going to have a calculator with you with a smartphone. And I guess, yeah, everybody's got the Bible on the smartphone. But you know what? I don't know about you. I don't want to be fumbling for my smartphone. Oh, here, let me download a Bible app real quick because I don't even have one. Let me figure out how this works, you know, trying to shuffle. And then, oh, I don't know where to turn. Hey, you know what? If I had that primo opportunity to give the gospel to somebody, I want Romans 3.23 just rolling off my tongue. I want Romans 6.23 rolling off the tongue. I want John 3.16 rolling right off my tongue. I want it to be smooth. I want to be able to easily and expertly preach the gospel to someone and take that opportunity. And you know what? That alone should motivate you to get out there and learn how to go soul winning. Even if you don't even have a burning desire to get you know random strangers saved which we ought to you know i mean god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son you know we should care about everybody and want to get everybody saved and just want to get out there but you know what even if you're just kind of like nah i don't really care about those people yeah but there are people that you do care about so how good of a job do you think you're going to do at witnessing to that person when you haven't witnessed to anyone in three and a half years? When it's been five years since you presented the gospel versus when it's been five days that you presented the gospel, who do you think is going to do a better job of giving the gospel? And you know what? I know this from experience because I remember as a teenager before I'd ever gone door to door soul winning and I had opportunities to give people the gospel and I did a lousy job. I was saved. I knew what the gospel was, but I did a lousy job of presenting the gospel and my friends didn't get saved because I didn't know what I was. I wasn't I wasn't using the Bible verses. I wasn't explaining things well. I just didn't have the tools. I didn't know what I was doing. And I was real proud of myself that I had witnessed to my friends. But I, you know, looking back, I did a poor job and that's why none of them got saved. You know, fast forward to when I turned 17 years old, I start going out door to door, winning souls to Christ. Now I start witnessing to my friends. Now I start witnessing to people at work and I'm just getting people saved, getting people saved. Tons of people getting relatives saved, co-workers saved, friends saved. Why? Because I actually learned how to do it. How do you learn? By doing, by experience, you know, and, and you know, the, 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 the great thing about a church like ours is that it's just so easy to get started because you show up at a soul winning time and you can literally just go as a silent partner. And, you know, and if, and if I were you, I would go with a variety of people, you know, because obviously some people in this church are going to be better at soul winning than others. And so I would go with a variety of people, see a lot of different people in action, see a lot of different styles, see what's out there, learn, let them show you the ropes. And then eventually... You know, I would encourage you to, to do the talking. But, you know, some people will remain a silent partner for several months. And that's okay. 
you know, I would never pressure anyone to, to start talking if they just want to be a silent partner. Uh, pastor Dave Bersons, you know, he, uh, of course, is a pastor in Atlanta now. But back when he first came to our church, he was my silent partner for like three months. And just week after week, he was just learning and observing. And, 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 and then finally, I remember the first time he gave the gospel. I remember the first time he did the talking. He literally dropped his Bible, you know, the, the proverbial dropping of the Bible. He was nervous, and but he got somebody saved, you know, he and, and obviously now, not only is he great at soul winning, I mean, he's behind the pulpit preaching whole sermons, you know, but you got to start somewhere, you know, and he started out as just being a silent partner on soul winning. But, you know, people that have been a silent partner for a really long time, you know, I would encourage you to start doing the talking and start giving the gospel, if for no other reason than that you will have the preparation of the gospel of peace when that opportunity falls in your lap and it's something that you really do care about. And so what does this, though, have to do with protecting us against the devil's attack? Well, let me tell you something, my friend. The people who don't go soul winning... They're open to attack from the devil in a lot of ways because soul winning really keeps you grounded in the reality of the gospel and in the reality of our Christian faith. OK, and, and people who don't do any soul winning, they can easily lose touch with this. You know, when you see people getting mixed up into stupid doctrines regarding salvation, like Calvinism. Or just, uh, or, or like repent of your sins type of goofball ideas and stuff. You know, when you see people going down those paths, these are typically people that are not out soul winning. Because these type of ideas aren't really compatible with soul winning. You know, if you're out there soul winning, when you're actually out there in the field, in the trenches, living real life, actually pulling people out of the fire, witnessing to people, man, it keeps you solid on your salvation doctrine. Not only because you're in the word of God preaching your salvation doctrine and you're, you're hearing the wrong objections from them and you're debunking these wrong objects. Not only that, but you're also participating in getting people saved. It makes it very real to you. Not just some theory. You know, it's sort of like these, these people that are off in some classroom somewhere kind of talking about communism or something and how, how communism is really truly wonderful and it's going to be great and it's going to work out. You know, and they're sitting around and theorizing. You know, it's like, it's like Plato or something, you know, devising his ideal state or his ideal republic. You know, it's pretty easy when you're just kind of sitting back in a chair coming up with your ideal republic or coming up with your little communist utopia or something, right? But then there are the people that are actually running countries or are actually dealing with groups of people in the real world and a lot of these stupid theories aren't really going to pan out right you know there, there's the guy who's not married telling you about marriage and then there's the guy who's actually been married for decades telling you about marriage right and it's going to be a little bit different because of the fact that stupid ideas often sound good on paper but then in reality they kind of are shown to be the, the falsehoods that they really are. When you actually, you know, the people who are actually doing the work in the field are like, yeah, that's not really how it is. You know, it's kind of like, like my dad uh, was in school and they were telling my dad that, you know, if you get shocked, if, if, if you get fried, you know, from one arm to the other, it'll kill you because the electricity will go through your heart. And my dad's like, that isn't true because if that were true, my dad would be dead and I'd be dead 20 times. You know, I personally have had have gotten shocked with like 110, 220 and 277 volts from my right arm to my left arm. I've gotten all three of those voltages at least all together, probably 15 to 20 times personally. And yet I'm still here. I'm a, I'm a walking miracle. No, it's just that it's just that every electrician in the world knows every who here is. An, are there any electricians here today? OK, keep your hand up if you've ever been shocked from arm to arm. Yeah. And you're all alive. Every every electrician, if they do it long enough, is eventually going to get electricity from one arm to the other and get fried. And they know that's not going to kill you because we've all done it. 
Even at 277 volts, I've done it. And it, it was very painful, but it doesn't kill you. Okay? What will actually kill you is from your right hand to your left foot. That will kill you because that does go through your heart. Or from your left hand to your right foot, that will kill you. But, you know, my dad had this guy in school, that, that this teacher that's saying, oh, yeah, arm to arm, that's going to kill you. You know, he knew that wasn't true. But this guy, for this guy, it's just a theory. He's just looking at pictures of the human body, and he's just thinking about it from a scientific perspective, right? But then there's the guy out there that's going, no, man, I'm fine, you know? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And so the, the point is that actually being out there in the field preaching the gospel to every creature keeps you, you know, no pun intended, but it keeps you grounded, you know, in the right gospel and the right salvation doctrine and the right doctrines about evangelism and soul winning. Because you know what? It's so funny when you when the Calvinists act like, oh, we Calvinists evangelize, and then they bring up some guy from the 1700s that evangelized. <laughs> kind of funny when you have to go back a few hundred years to find examples uh, of, of evangelism going on. You and I both know that Calvinists aren't constantly knocking our doors and, and preaching the gospel to us. Or, you know, or, or Calvinists aren't walking up to us on college campuses and, and, and trying to win us to the Lord. You know, and by the way, all throughout my life, I've had a bunch of people come to my door or walk up to me in public, walk up to me at the gym. I've had people come up to me at the gym and try to win me to Christ at the gym. Who's ever had somebody at the gym try to win you to the Lord? I've had multiple times people come up to me at the gym and give me the gospel and try to win me to Christ or out front of place. And, and you know what? I love it because I'm just like, I'm already saved, but I'm really encouraged whenever people are out evangelizing, you know, because I'm talking about true saved Christians are evangelizing. And I've had people, even within the last like two years, I've had like a couple people walk up to me and try to win me the Lord. I guess I've just seemed like an approachable guy, <laughs> but I've had a couple people try to win me to Christ over the last few years. And, you know, I love that when that happens, because, you know, it's just like, it's so encouraging that people are out there witnessing. But you know what? It, 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 these, it, it's not the Calvinists that are out. It's, you know, they've never been Presbyterian. They just haven't. I'm sorry, but they haven't. Just the reality is they're always Baptist or evangelicals of some kind. Coming, hence the name evangelical, you know. Uh, coming up to you and giving you the gospel. You know, being out there soul winning is going to keep you grounded in right doctrine. And it's also going to give, give you the confidence to know, hey, my Christian life is right. What the Bible teaches is right. I'm doing it right. I need to keep doing what I'm doing. You know what? You, you're not just going to get detethered and say like, man, I don't even know. Maybe I should just start living like the world. Maybe I should just be, you know, going down some other path. No, man, because when you're soul winning, it really keeps you anchored. Just like the truth, just like the righteousness. The, the preparation of the gospel of peace also keeps you anchored in right belief. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Again, faith. Faith means believing. Believing God's word. Trusting God's word. You know, the devil's coming at you trying to get you to doubt the Christian way of life. Trying to get you to doubt his word. And the shield of faith just says, no. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I'm going to trust God's word no matter what. I have ultimate faith in the Bible. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And that's really where the discussion on the armor pretty much ends. He segues into just talking about his prayer requests and so forth. And so we as Christians, we want to have the complete package the whole armor of God. Look, if you think about armor, the whole point of armor is to cover everything. Because whatever is that exposed portion, that's where the devil's going to go for. I mean, right? If you're out in battle, whatever is that exposed area, that's where the enemy is going to aim. Right? They're not just going to just stab you in the breastplate. They're looking for that chink in the armor. Okay? And so whatever weak spot that you have in the evil day, that's what's going to be exploited. That's what the devil's going to exploit. 
So if you're kind of one of these reality denying types that just doesn't really care what truth is, and you're just kind of like, well, I just kind of believe whatever my church says, believe whatever my pastor says, whatever. I don't really care. Okay, just 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 tell me what to believe because I don't really care. You know, if you're not a lover of truth, you don't have the whole package. You don't have the whole armor of God. You know, you 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 you're not putting into practice the Christian life. You, you, you know, you, you maybe have a lot of good knowledge and faith and beliefs, but you're not actually a doer of the word. You don't have the whole package. You're not prepared to give someone the gospel. If, if, if we held a gun to your head right now and said, present the gospel, you're going to be like, ah. You know, you don't have the shield of faith. You're, you're constantly doubting, doubting what God has told us to do. Helmet of salvation. You know, here's the thing. Obviously, if you're saved, you're saved. So how do you put on the, the helmet of salvation? Well, over in First Thessalonians, this is called, for an helmet, the hope of salvation. And what that means is that it's the idea of knowing that you're saved. Having that hope. The Bible says that the righteous has hope in his death. Amen. You know, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? You see, a lot of Christians who are truly saved, who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, they doubt their salvation. I think all of us have doubted our salvation at one time or another because we're human. You know, I know I've doubted my salvation before. We, we, you know, uh, we've all doubted. But at the end of the day, the people who are doubting their salvation the most are usually the people that are kind of backslidden kind of away from church, away from soul winning, away from reading their Bible, and they can start to, you know, get untethered from those things. Even though they are truly saved, they can start to doubt. And, and look, there are people that are saved, but they're shaky on their salvation. They're shaky on their salvation doctrine. They're shaky on the assurance of salvation. You know, in order to really have this piece of armor securely in place, you've got to basically know that you're saved. And be confident about why you're saved. I know I'm saved. I know why I'm saved. I know what it means to be saved. And you know, and by the way, the people have the preparation of the gospel of peace. They got the helmet of salvation on tight. You know. But you and I, we've run into people out soul winning that were saved, but they're 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 shaky on it. They're not. They their their helmets rattling all over their head. And you kind of, you know, obviously our main goal out soul winning is to get people saved. But sometimes also we just walk up to somebody who's already saved and we kind of just take that helmet of salvation. We adjust it for him and tighten the chin strap <laughs> and get it on tight. And, you know, that's worth doing as well. That's part of our ministry as well is helping give people assurance of their salvation and then helping get people tightened up on salvation doctrine. And so, you know, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You got to be reading the Bible and praying. So, look, the bottom line is when the evil day comes, whatever weakness you have in your armor is going to be exploited. So you want to make sure that you got the whole deal. You, you know, you're, you're a lover of truth. You're standing on truth. You know the truth. You believe the truth. Right. You're, you're living a righteous life in accordance with God's word. Obviously, no one's perfect, but you're putting into practice the word of God. You're following his teachings. You got your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You got that helmet of salvation. You got the shield of faith. You're ready to quench whatever the devil throws uh, things at you. You're quenching those things with the shield of faith. You're reading your Bible. You're praying, right? If you're reading your Bible, praying, you're standing on truth. You're ready to preach the gospel. Look, if you if you put these things into practice, you will be able to stand in the evil day. Why? Is it because you're so mighty? No, because you're being strong in the Lord Amen. and in the power of his might. And if you will do these things that you're supposed to do, God will do the rest. But if you're one who has everything I mentioned, but you don't read your Bible, that weakness is going to be exploited someday. You're doing all these things, but you don't pray. That's a weakness that can be exploited. You know, you're, you're, you're super faithful, super righteous, doctrinally sound, but you don't do any soul winning. You're not able to witness. You know what? You're going to become a victim of the devil's attack at some point because, because he's looking for an opening. And if you, if you give him an opening, he's going to exploit it. And so let's, as Christians, make sure that we put on the whole armor of God 
and and to realize that look following the christian life and following the principles that we've been taught in chapters four five and six is not going to be easy right it seems easy until you start doing it and you start getting attacked that's where you're gonna wish man i wish i read my bible i wish i was ready to preach i wish i you know you all those things are gonna suddenly matter to you when things are going smooth you don't need these things you know the whole armor of god is cumbersome you know uh when it's easy but my friend you better put it on because you don't know when that evil day is coming you better be ready for it let's pray and have a word of prayer father we thank you so much for your word Thank you for giving us everything we need to be fully equipped and armed to stand in the evil day. Lord, help us to withstand. Lord, there's an arg- there's an organized onslaught of all of the devil's minions uh, using the media, using businesses, corporations, uh, governments. Lord, help us to be able to, to hold on to the ground that you've already Uh, conquered for us at the cross lord help us to be able to withstand and help us to be able to live that quiet and peaceable life that you want us to live in all godliness and honesty and in jesus name we pray amen man take your hymnals please hymn number 10 let's go to hymn number 10 near the cross hymn number 10 We'll sing it out together on that first verse now. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Hymn number 10. Sing it out now. Jesus, keep me near the cross. 